one. Now, there are many areas of the world that I've looked at with my seminars, lectures, talks, or whatever you want to call, call them over the years. But I have never presented anything to do with Japan. And, and, I'm, and to be honest with you, I, I don't know why, because I've had links with Japan over the years. And I used to have a very good friend called Yoshio Uida, um, who used to visit us on a regular basis about 20 years ago. And he used to come along to the excavation and we used to chat with him on the phone. And he used to love Wales very much because of the trees here, because he saw uh, Wales as being very similar to Japan. And whenever, he, whenever he'd come and see us, uh, he would always bring gifts. And um, there's, there's one gift that I've, I've got with me that uh, is, is tied onto my bag. It's something that actually his wife made, it's this. And uh, so I've kept this with me and it goes with me everywhere. Yoshi's no longer with us. Um, he would be about 90 now. And I think he may have been, um, I think he may have been involved in the Second World War at some level, but he would have been at that stage. So the area of Japan we're gonna look at is quite a, a wide area in time. It's called the Yamon culture of Japan. Now, when we look at periods in time or cultures or anything, they usually last for a thousand years, a hundred years, and that's it. But the Yamon culture in Japan lasted over 10,000 years. And it's a, it's a rather <coughs> intriguing period uh, within the Japanese landscape and within Japanese consciousness. And I... And I um, endeavour to look at far out other areas of archaeology that I've never looked at. Um, last night we mentioned the um, Scilly Islands. I thought, yes, I've got to do a talk on the archaeology on the Scilly Islands. So, so let's, let's crack on with this. So I would like to look at a chart. And it's this chart in front of us. But whilst you've got this chart in front of you and i'm just going to double check you do have a chart in front of you don't you keep yeah good the beginnings of the yamon culture the end of the ice age coincided with the closure of the paleolithic era so here we go fifteen thousand years ago so everyone get their pens out fifteen thousand years ago that's the end of the paleolithic period in regards to Japan. It's a period that they're developing their microlithic culture, small um, obsidian flints, shirts, chalcodony tools, which you find across the whole of Japan. And this takes us back to 15,000 years ago. 15,000 years ago, 13,000 years BC, 15,000 years ago. It's rather interesting that when you, when you look at 15,000 years ago, <coughs> And you think of when our ice age ended, because the Paleolithic period, um, the end of the Paleolithic period coincides with the end of the ice age. So if we want to look at the end of our ice age, that's 12,000 years ago. So our ice age ends 3000 years later. So in other words, we're going to be 3000 years behind Japan, whatever way you look at it, because with the receding of the ice, this is when humanity and civilization takes over. Now, one question that I had a couple of weeks ago when we were looking at Peking Man, and I've got the details here, is that um, it was asked, what are the earliest hominids in regards to Japan? And the answer is, I, I knew the answer. I said, we've got the remains of Homo erectus in Japan. And I was able to answer that straight away. But I, I sort of thought, you know, Homo erectus in Japan maybe 200,000 years ago or something. But it dates all the way back to nearly 400,000 years ago in Japan. So we've got Homo erectus scenes in Japan. So that makes this, this whole start of Japan very interesting. Because the same problem is that we get the Homo erectus scenes disappear. They, they all jump into the sea like little lemmings. And then suddenly 
the ancestors of modern day Japanese um, go over to Japan on the land bridges from the north and the land bridge uh, over the island chain towards the west, all the way from China. Um, and therefore the evolution of the Japanese and going into the Yaman culture is all thanks to these waves of people coming over at that time. And it bids the question, three questions. Um, so what happened? The Homo erectus scenes just fell off the earth and they were all hunted to death in China. Also the same happened in Japan. Also the same happened in Australia and Siberia. And you start to work out that what we're told is a load of nonsense. We've, we've got to go with these early waves of people uh, being the great ancestors of those people there today. But that's what I feel. But that's what the evidence somewhat tells us. So when we think about um, the end of their ice age 15,000 years ago, um, we, we start to see stone tools really developing, as I've mentioned. And somewhere along 15,000 years ago, all the way up to 11,000 years ago. So there we go. That's the period known as the incipient Yamon culture. And then the Yamon culture goes on and on and on and on. It's, 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 it's the, the, same, the same little things that, that, that go through this Yamon culture for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Actually, the Yamon culture um, ends um, approximately 300 years BC. So that's um, 2,300 years ago. The reason why I'm talking about the importance of this one period, this really, really long period, is that when you compare this with Britain, for example, you've got the Stone Age, you've got the Neolithic, you've got the Bronze Age, you've got the Iron Age, oh, and you've got the Romans for AD 43. So you've got these, these individual periods, but they're really distinctive. Really distinctive things happen. This Yamon culture Distinctive things happen, but they've got pottery very early on. So you see pottery traced all the way through. Like not, it's not the same when we look at our cultural development, if the word cultural is the right, right word to use. So when we get, when we get um, really, we start around this, um, really we, we look at this incipient period here, this incipient Yamon culture. Um, and then somewhere around 11,000 years ago, uh, we've got um, rapid global warming or climate warming, we should call it. Global warming is a more modern term. And what we do have with this 11,000 years ago, 9,000 years BC, what we do find is vast swathes of deciduous broad leaved forests. Uh, and you've got the the oak trees of various strains of the oak. Um, and you've got the chestnut. So chestnut tree, you've got the walnut tree as well. Uh, and various other um, creeds and types of trees going out there, um, which is, becomes widespread. So in, in a way, when we become disconnected as an island, what happens is that uh, our landscape gets swamped by trees as well. But like Australia, like many island domains, there's um, a, a rapid rise in water level um, inundation along the coast. Um, and there's lots of sedimentary deposition um, across the landscape of Japan due to um, heavy rainfall forming the terrain. Um, you've got rich rivers, you've got rich seascapes, nice word. And this sort of develops this, this land of the Yamon. So what it would be good to do now is just look at this little bit of a chart in front of us. And then we'll go through to uh, this initial period. We'll go through to the early Yamon period, uh, which is ends in 5,000. I hope everybody's taking notes of all this. And the reason why I'm hoping everybody's taking notes of all this, because this is important um, when we're actually looking at the artifacts and the sites, when I say uh, this sort of initial period, 11,000 to uh, 7,000 years ago, 
it's good to know where that is and it's good to equate that with our own history and archaeology our own timeline and in many ways um even though the Yamon culture is thousands of years in advance of ours you can see little areas of development in Japan that we we see here um you know when we look at pottery development in a way um we, we look at um um structural development and so on so this this coming into 15,000 years ago sometime around that we've got lots of stone arrowheads and lots of stone implements lots more of those microliths um, and then we start to see pottery and this is rather interesting because if, if we if we think about pottery and we think about the development of pottery in our own country we're not really getting pottery um in our own con country until about um seven eight thousand years ago at, at, the, at the at the earliest so you've got pottery developing in in japan fifteen thousand years ago or maybe that's a bit early but it's in this incipient period of the amon and, and it, the other massive thing on this chart, you actually see permanent settlement as well. Permanent settlement. Now, this permanent settlement and the pottery and, and um, the sense of communication between settlements, them over there, them over there, here, roadways, routeways, trade, that sort of cultural change, exchange. Um, um, it, it's, it's something that's really early in Japan. Because we don't really see, we're thinking about settlements really early on, 15,000 years ago in Japan, 14, uh, 13, 12, we just ended our ice age here, they're already living in houses. We're not really getting evidence of houses until about nine, 10,000 years ago at Hoik on the northeastern coast of England. So again, these, these are 3,000 years ahead of us. Um, and and then we get this other period here. We, we get um, this, this period known as the incipient period, this climate warming um, and the, um, the, 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 um, the retreat of the sea um, or the advance of the sea um, in, in sedimentary and then um, the advance of sea levels around the coast, um, swamping large air tracks of the coast as we see in Australasia. Um, and, and lots of lots of evidence, lots of the evidence here is is when we look at the word shell middens, we well you know shell middens are really important when we um, entertain looking at our own landscape. And this this these shell middens in this initial period actually put us more or less into when we're getting shell middens, when when we're getting when we got shell middens 10,000, 9,000, 8,000 years ago in Britain. We've got something very similar when we look at the Yamon culture in Japan. Um, and, and then we, excitingly enough, um, 7,000 years ago to 5,000 years ago, we've got cylindrical pottery cultures formed, advances in pottery, uh, the numbers of settlements increase. So this, uh, the point here, numbers of settlements increase, the, the complicated nature of settlements i.e. you know almost townships and so on developing townships temples burial whatever shops and plazas and so on we don't get anything like that in this country up until about um just before the just before the romans invade britain we've got development of of um small towns um pseudo towns developing before the romans get to britain but this isn't until around the birth of christ we're, we're looking at proper sort of cultural um, trade centers um, occurring here in Japan 5,000 years before us. So it, it's, it's very different, di very different. Um, but in no way do I want to say that, um, you know, the Japanese are better than us or we're better than the Japanese or anything like that. What I'm trying to do is, is, is a cultural look and, and see a different area of archaeology, a different area of history. That's what I want to introduce to you today. Um, and look at this really interesting thing. I had to, I had to, um, I had to do a bit of research into the lacquering process of, of pottery. They used to lacquer pottery, and they used to actually lacquer wooden bowls. Um, and the lacquering is basically using um, resin, 
which is coming from um, a, an oak variety of tree. Um, and they lacquer that over pottery or they lacquer that over um, wooden bowls. Well, a wooden bowl might have rotted away, but more or less this amber coating is still on the outside. It's, 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 a, it's, it's usually a red sort of lacquer in color as well. So thousands, again, thousands of years before we get anything like this in the West, lacquering, it, it's, it's a very, very advanced glaze. Well, we're not really glazing our pottery at this time, 5,000 years ago either. So we've got very crude pottery. So, um, so then we go into, and, and also at the same time on, on the right there, you'll see another column. Um, and it's basically saying this sort of early Yamon period, um, you, you get the, the, the birth of Chinese civilization, um, a Mesopotamian civilization starting to think um, and starting to be and starting to be aware. So, but these are um, a multi-regional um, developments of civilization. And there are there may be trade links between the two, but they're not influentially massive on each other. They're they're determining their future rather than diffused all the way from one point. Everybody everything evolves out of Africa and all that nonsense, right? So it, it all determines its own environments. This is how Japan's going. It's got the conditions to go this in this direction. You know, when when the Chancellor says we got the conditions to do this now, well, well we back then, because they've got all these things, they've got the conditions to go forward in their civilization. Um, and in many ways, when we see mainland China and we look about gunpowder and all the rest of it, I know this is thousands of years later, developing anything like this before us, you know, it's determined from a local locality and this is how the minds think. It's, it's that old adage, isn't it? If we put a load of monkeys in a room, eventually um, together they would write the complete works of Shakespeare. Somebody said that if you put a load of monkeys in a room and they were typing, eventually after 20 years they would complete the complete works of Shakespeare. I don't know what, I don't know how true that is, probably not, but what I'm trying, what, what, what that means is that evolution will occur, whatever happens, it will happen. And then if, if we look, if we look here, this, this, this date 5,000 years ago, going into the middle of Yamon, if you want to go 5,000 years ago, middle of Yamon, you've already got Scara Bray uh, and you've got the construction of Stonehenge. You don't have big settlements in Great Britain. You've got pottery. Look at this year, large scale hub settlements develop. So in other words, um, sort of, urban like landscapes a bit like what we were starting to see in mesopotamia <coughs> and you see this with the egypt and the great pyramids and the indus valley that's another area that we haven't looked at in india and in this middle yamon period um, 5000 to 4000 years ago 3000 to 2000 years bc you've also got extensive trade in jade obsidian and like you could probably jump jump in there maybe early silks and so on. Um, that's what we might equate with the trade links associated with ancient Egypt, because at this time, Egypt is probably into the same trade link that Japan's into when we look at the dates here, 4,000, nearly 5,000 years ago. So what I'd like to um, quickly do now is this last bit, which seems a bit silly. Look at that there. You can imagine the archaeologists, they're excavating through and they say, right, this is, this is, the, um, this is the latest period of the Yamon culture. Um, this is 3,000 years ago. And another archaeologist said, no, you can't call that the latest period. This is the final period. And you've got an argument saying, well, this, this is the late period of the Yamon. No, I said, mine, mine is even more closer to time. You know, this ends. 2,300 years ago. So the, the Japanese have got this late Yamon period from th this, this, um, this date here. So you've got 4,000 to 3,000 years ago. And then you've got this, um, this final period of Yamon, which takes us to 
um, 2,300 um, years ago. So this, this final period is quite short. So what is, what is interesting when you look at the, the way things are developing in, in Japan is the following. So we go into this late period and it says here, this is what's interesting here. The number of large scale hub settlements seen in the middle period decreases as settlements become decentralized, so stone circles emerge. Now, we've already got stone circles in Britain, so we're one step ahead of these guys. But, um, but this thing about this thing, this is really interesting because they've got all these large scale settlements and they said, oh, we don't need large scale settlements anymore. We'll go to smaller scale um, trading centers, which are, uh, which are more advanced than the cities. It's almost as if that's a pattern for modern day civilization. Um, it's turned out that having big cities is not is not of much benefit these days because you look at what's happening, shut down, people can't move around cities. If you live in the countryside, you're still able to move around or wander around fields. And in, in many ways, we could learn from this in saying that everybody living in cities is probably not a good idea. And these Japanese knew this. They knew this four thousand years ago. I don't know. I don't know if that's um, that's got any relevance, but you can see that there's something there. And then in this final Yaman period, we got really weird figures developing, like um, Google-eyed clay figures and clay masks, and and many other tools for rituals are made along with a variety of accessories. And what we do see is a rice culture. They're, they're, now their economy is very much based on rice. Obviously, rice has been within their, their economy for a long time, but, but rice is very much in there. So what, what we, we should do now, this is a Google-eyed figure from the late Yaman period. And to get an idea, the, these, these figures are, are not massive figures. This, this isn't a foot in the height, actually. But this is a, a nice, um, this is a nice, um, this is a nice piece of pottery, uh, ceramic piece of pottery, and um, this 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 itself with a Google-eyed, uh, a really advanced form of pottery, and this is in their late Yaman period. And now we're going to go back. We're going to go back to the beginning. Um, so we've done our big overview of, the, of these charts. So we're going to go back all the way back. Go back. Go back. Yaman people needed clay to create pottery in shapes they liked and they learned to make strong containers through chemical changes by applying heat now this is a revolution and being able to heat your food by boiling it is a revolution and also to be able to store food is also a revolution hunter gatherer people now we look at the yamon as a primarily hunter-gatherer people that use that use their 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 extensive resources, they're not a massive farming people um, in the early part of the Yaman. They're very much hunter-gatherer, but the difference is they're hunter-gatherer gathering. They're boiling and storing their food, um, and they're now leading a sedentary life in one area. So it's hunter-gatherer, but sort of staying in one 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 site, in other words, and. So people were now able to utilize natural resources more widely by boiling ingredients. So in other words, those things over there that you weren't able to eat before, if you boil them down, you can eat them. It softens them. It gets rid of all the acids. You can now eat them. So in other words, your larder is extensive without leaving your front door. So you don't really need this mass agriculture that we rely upon when we look at our development within our isolated island. Naturally, Great Britain is much smaller than Japan. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very much more of a little speck compared with the likes of Japan. So Japan's got a larger larder. And it's, it's quite a statement to make, but we're gonna look at pottery for a little bit now. And the creation of pottery stabilized the diet of the Yaman people. So in other words, instead of just, I think, I think, the, I, I think if we want to compare this with the diet in medieval, medieval England, you always get medieval 
um, medieval English people um, scrobbling around before the advent of tomatoes and before the advent of potatoes um, and all these wonderful things that we take for granted now. The, the, the medieval diet in England was really, really bland. Maybe that's an overstatement. But compared to the Japanese, it was really, really bland in our medieval period. Uh, but the Japanese had a huge larder and boiling and food storage has got a lot to do with that. So the Yamon culture itself, we, we look at pottery throughout the Yamon culture being created for well over 10,000 years, well over 10,000 years. And although there are differences in regional pottery throughout Japan, what we do see is that there are key movements of development of pottery. Now, this pottery itself would be very similar to the likes of Kathy, um, who's handled some of this pottery with me when we visited the um, um, University of Highlands and Islands Archaeology Department, and we've um, you know, we've handled this type of stuff. But that's in a Neolithic context. We we get we've got pottery like this in the Neolithic period, um, six seven thousand years ago. Uh, but in in Japan, they've got this um, 12, 13, 14,000 years ago, this same type of pottery, this pottery. And the earliest pottery was plain, naturally, it was quite thick. So the walls of the pottery would be just, just, un, just under the thickness of your little pinky. Uh, this is how thick the pottery was, really, really chunky stuff. And it's only, it's, oh, they're only lightly firing at this stage. They're lightly heating it up. So we're looking at about um, 300 degrees C, 350, and that's it. The problem is with pottery like that, it needs to get up to about 400, 450, 500, 600 degrees C uh, to be pottery that, that can last the test of time. So this earlier pottery is, uh, is decaying quite rapidly when re-exposed to water and boiling, but it's good enough for, the, for what they wanted at the time. Now, I can't really go into massive detail, but lots of the decoration that they do see is created by the nail on the end of the finger. So we've got lots of nail designs on the pottery. And we see that using the nail to sort of incise marks onto the pottery. I think that's great that you can see that. So they're getting decoration from an early stage. And also they're using cord on this pottery. Um, we do see cord impressed pottery within a Neolithic context in Britain, but then again, that's not for thousands of years. So the cord impressed pottery that we do see in regards to the Amon uh, culture uh, gives decoration. And also when you use, when you use cord impressions, it, it gives some more stability to the pot as well. And in lots of ways, decoration offers it. it, it, it I, I could go into a, a lot more detail there, but um, having a plain wall pottery aids to cracking as it dries out. If you've got incised, if it's slightly incised and you've got a crack forming, that will go to the inside, incised mark, impression with the nail, and won't go any further through the pot. This is why decoration is key to this early pottery. It stabilizes the pottery. So, and you, you can see these these are like, these are these are like the types of things that uh, you might find on a footpath outside Kathy's house, or uh, you might find these in your in your breakfast cereal. But no, this is actually pottery. Th these are the these are the fragments. These these are regular fragments of pottery that we actually find at these these early Yamon sites. We can't call them early Yamon sites, can we? We've got to call it the, the incipient, the incipient Yamon period, because we've got an early Yamon period as well. Joe, I, I think you, you can work out what's going on with the Japanese, can't you? They, they've, sort of, they've sort of thought, right, this is all the Yamon culture. And somebody said, actually, there's a period before the early Yamon period. Yeah, I know there is. Okay, we'll call it the, the initial Yamon period. And then somebody said, actually, there's a period before the initial, and we'll call it the incipient. 
you can see the Japanese thinking like that. But anyway, carry on. So this is that incipient pottery, the very earliest pottery. And again, comparisons in Neolithic um, Britain, particularly Orkney, about um, 7,500 7, years ago or thereabouts. The dates go a lot earlier. And what we do, what we do see is, um, I, I chuck in a couple of sites. So we, this is the site of Oda Yamamato, Yoda Yamamato. And this is one of the, those very early sites from the incipient period. So they're not, just, they're not just finding the pottery, they're actually finding the sites where this pottery is associated with settlements and, and so on and so on. As we mentioned, this sort of early settlement evidence and fires and, and, um, and hut circles and so on. This is, um, this is a, a comparing, this is, this is probably, this is a bit later actually, this is the um, Komarkino site. This is, so another Yamon site from a little, little bit later. So this, this itself is the next stage of pottery. So we go into 11,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago, the initial Yamon period. And one thing I was thinking of last night after I spent time with Goff, I, I was actually thinking, well, when you look at these periods in the Yamon, uh, they, they say, so the incipient period in, is in 4,000 4, years, and the initial period is 4,000 years, but the early period is only 2,000 years, and the middle period is only 1,000 years, and then a lot period is 1,000 years. So periods get um, tighter and tighter in time, less, less and less length. And it's probably because as, as, <clears throat> as, tech, as technology grows, that the development periods are less. So if you if you want to compare, for example, the last century, there was a massive development in the last century. We, we've, we've got, for example, cars, planes, space rockets, computers. But if you want to compare the computers now with the computers that were um, in 2000, they are massively advanced. So we've really moved massively on. But there's another point to be made there. We haven't really developed our cars much in the past um, hundred years. They've still got four wheels. They don't fly, um, and they, they don't go massively fast because they're encumbered by 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 the roads and so on. The planes, for example, planes are as unsafe as they were a hundred years ago as they are now. So that type of technology hasn't improved. Computer technology has moved massively. So you see this with all civilizations where things work like tools. The the, um, the 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 lithic tools, the the uh, the chalcedony, the the flint, the obsidian, they're still using the same types of tools for thousands of years. It's not developing because it doesn't need to. Like a car, we still drive them on the on the road. We're all happy to drive 50 miles an hour. That's it. So the cars don't really need to develop much further. And it's the same with a with a, a space. It's the same with an aeroplane. You still can't fly to Australia in an hour. It still takes you 24 hours and 18 hours now isn't it but it's it's still it's still that thing we really haven't developed planes very much in the past hundred years you can argue with me on that but we haven't so um but this is this is the same as all these cultures things that work they don't seem to move on fast but other things move on quite rapidly and the one thing that moves quite rapidly in the Yamon culture is their pottery and, and what's happening with their pottery so this this is so we go into this initial period of the Yamon and what we do see is pottery that's that's moved massively well actually over a few thousand years but it's actually moved quite a lot actually and um, regional differences in the shape and pattern of pottery become apparent so what we've got we've got this like tapering base this 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 really weird um tapered base this this pointed pointed base if you, if you squint your eye and, and sort of put your hand like that, it looks like a bit like an amphora, doesn't it? An amphora base. So what we're seeing is their impressions are increasing, not, not in regards to this one, but they're using shell impressions on them. Um, the walls of the pottery are actually getting thinner, which is, again, a revolution. They've got pointed bottoms. And, you know, when we look at this initial period, things are moving on with, with, with settlements and so on. And, and obviously the settlements are, are, are growing because they're able to store. Pottery is really helpful there. And, and, and pottery lasts a lot longer. When, when your pottery's lasting a lot longer, 
you don't have to expend as much time making it. So, so when, when we think about this, um, this initial Yamon period, what we do find, um, I, 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 I thought I'd put this in there, but try not to burn people's minds out. So what we're talking about is this, this, this wonderful, this wonderful um, site here. And if I can just, um, I had the name of it here somewhere, but anyway, th this, this site itself is showing you these, these earlier, start again, the, the initial Yaman period buildings from, from 11,000 to 7,000 years ago. And what you do see quite starkly is that they're slight, they're slightly subterranean, um, but they're slightly, so if you look at that, where the cursor is there, that would be several, that would be about a foot, two feet, foot into the ground, right? And then over time, the layers develop around the outside and so on, but they're always semi-subterranean buildings. And what you can actually see is, is you can see in, these buildings are all circular, but you can see that they're slightly different in time and arrangements inside. So you've got this little fire in the middle, all these little paths in the middle. And what you do see, is also an arrangement or an inner, um, an inner concentric cir circle of post holes, which would support the central apex of the roof. And then it got post holes around um, towards the edge that would then um, support the, um, the, the external um, outside walls of the building, obviously support the roof again. Mm. And over time, what we do find is that people have lived in these localities for thousands of years. Um, rebuilding and development at the same site, rebuild and development at the same site. This is why we've got all these different layers, these wonderful readable layers. And look at that there, the black is actually organic residue. It's not just fired residue, it's organic residue. It's peats, um, it's charcoals, wonderful for um, dendrochronology, wonderful for radiocarbon dating. Um, just, just one thing for people who are, are very much in, interested in archeological excavation techniques, this, um, this system is known as the grid square excavation system uh, used by Flinders Petrie, but um, used to a massive degree by the likes of Ari M. Wheeler, Sir Mortimer Wheeler, the grid box square excavation method. And the way this works is that you, you, they haven't used it with this area, that they've used an area excavation method here, found the outlines of the buildings and just excavated down. So they haven't exactly done this one, but they've done these ones. And what you do see here is they've used another method to understand um, the, the external area of the site. And as you dig into these boxes, you can read the strata on the site. So you can see that, let me go, that's the final Yamon period at the top. That's the late Yamon, that's the middle Yamon, early, initial, incipient, maybe a little Paleolithic activity underneath as well. So this is what we're seeing with this archeology. span And I've got to be honest with you, um, I might be putting them across as airs and graces, but there's no airs and graces about the Japanese archaeology. They do, the arch they do their archaeology, they're quite proud of their archaeology, but they don't ram it down your throats. I I've always, I've been accused lots, lots of, of being somebody that rams Roman culture down somebody's throat. I'm not trying to do that. Roman culture is very influential when we look at Britain. It lasted for over 400 years. But the Japanese, what they, what they do with their Yamon culture, they say, this is what we've got. This is the development. We do understand it very well. And we've got lots of evidence for it. So this is one of those, this is one of those buildings for one of those, one of the, one of those buildings for the initial uh, Yamon period. And what you can see is an arrangement of post holes. And the other thing that can be said is that as post holes rotted, they would need to dig more post holes. Um, it, it's likely that um, there are different periods of post holes associated with these buildings. And these little holes in the ground are for the external skirt of the building. And maybe some of these others might be for little partitions in the building as well. But this is showing you a building uh, over a long period of time. Again, as our, as our Japanese friend. And, and Ellen will be right in thinking that none of them are wearing hard hats. So again, what we're also seeing is large banks developing, developing with this initial Yamon period, a large, very complicated sites. And again, another image from this initial Yamon period. And that's very interesting there. 
um, what they're doing in the centre. And that is a post hole. Uh, it looks very much like a post hole. It's too deep for a half. And what we do as archaeologists, we quarter a, we quarter a post hole, or in this case, a third of the post hole. So what we do, we excavate all down methodically, all the way down, take a sample out, read that sample and maybe get some charcoal evidence and you might backfill there. So in future generations, somebody can excavate and they can find this archaeology intact uh, for you to look at and um, understand at a later period, all evidence from this initial Yamon period in Japan. So where do we go now? What's up YouTube? So where do we go now? So what we've got is you can see pottery has actually changed. It's no longer, it's no longer this um, pointed bottom. And actually, this is something that we go through in our Neolithic period. We've got rounded bottoms at one stage, and we've got flat bottoms, rounded bottoms. It's a, like a fashion thing, developmental changes and so on. By, there's lots of different reasons behind it. So this is now, um, now we're going into the early Amon period. And we mentioned, we mentioned shells and we mentioned shell mounds and so on. And when, when we look at the regional differences, this pottery has now got flat bottoms. It's known as cylindrical pottery. And there are different chord marks on them. And we, and that's one point I didn't make earlier on. Can't exactly see it on this, but you've got these sort of cylindrical uh, type forms and designs on them. But we know that they're using cord to give decoration and design to these because as they've um, as the pottery is set as it is going off it's gone green right just before you put it in the kiln they remove the cord and they're pulling the cord off and <coughs> it's leaving fibers in the pottery so not only can we understand the design and what they're using to make the design we can understand the fibers in the cord giving you a little bit more evidence to what rope and stuff they're actually using in society. And lots of this, lots of this, um, lots of this uh, evidence of shell middens from this period as well. This is a site known as Kita Kogan. And these, and they've done a little bit of a reconstruction there of a shell mound. So we've looked at the initial period. We're now into the middle period. Now, the middle period is from 5,000 to 4,000 years ago. We're not producing anything like this in Britain until uh, the Romans are here. We're producing nothing like this. So if you're thinking that they're producing this up to 4,000 years ago, this is 2,000 years before we're producing anything like this. And there's something really weird with the pottery. It's the number four. You've got one, two, three, four handles. One, two, three, four handle type spoke things. One, two, three, four. It's the number four, not the number seven or the number three, the number four. The other, the other word to actually use is the applique design. Applique is not only a, a design that you can see in the arts and crafts movement in the 1920s and the 1930s, a plique is a, a way of creating little incised marks on the outside of the outside of the the pot as it's as it's going green. So you might get a little bit of a stamp in there. That's that that could be classed as a plique. But typical a plique is when you get a little bit of bamboo and you actually make little marks in it, little sort of chevrons or little dot designs to sort of make it look really ornate. This cylindric, this wonderful cylindrical pottery. And it's classed, if the exact word for these sort of four handle type things on the side um, is the four waves. That's what my notes call them, the, the, the four waves on the pot. So this is a very interesting period of development and different areas of Japan at this, at this time across this Yamon world um, in the middle Yamon culture has different designs regionally. So you can actually see, you can get an idea of trade. I don't know if any of you uh, what about when I did my, my lecture on the likes of the Nazca people in different areas of the Nazca world a thousand years ago in South, um, South America and Chile, along the Andes. 
uh, different areas of the Nazca had different pottery and they might go on a pilgrimage to a location with their pot and they might smash it on one of those uh, one of those Nazca line sites or whatever. But different areas are distinctive um, in the Nazca culture for the different types of pottery. And it's the same can be said for Japan. Different designs for different areas. This this is this is again when when you've got this middle uh, you've got this middle period. Things are starting to change. Things are starting to develop in their, their society. And, and look at this now. What we're finding is that they, they've got these buildings with very large post holes. And the one thing that must be said now is that these large post holes indicate one massive thing, that the buildings are not single story, they're multiple story. Also, these post holes might indicate basement areas, they might indicate buildings that can that are above ground if there's flooding or tsunami. Uh, it also indicates that having different levels, uh, you can have, um, you don't need as many buildings out there. You don't need a large sprawl urban area. So the urban ways are going now. You've got these small individual settlements again that are self-supporting. They've got everything. Starting to think about a more agricultural sedentary life. And we do look at a few reconstructed um, illustrations coming up. And also the one best way to look at this is, is the strata. So you might say that if we want to draw in here, you might look at that, that from the first stage of the building and then the second stage of building here and the third stage of building there, four stage, five stage, and so on and so on. So what we've got, we've got different stages of development in this building, but always do we have a slightly subterranean building with these large post holes driven into the ground, particularly in this middle Yamon period. It, uh, it would be so easy for me to get um, lost in the Yamon periods. Um, and what they've got here, this is a site of Ufu. And at Ufu uh, in, in, in Japan, obviously, what we do find is this is what they're portraying, these like slightly subterranean buildings. And they've so they've got some post holes in here demonstrating that and then they say right what we've got we've got these post holes we, we develop these post holes in in here may have floor levels and then we go over to this building um, that, that again is might have a loft or something in it as well so um, in essence we might have a building that's got three levels here so they've got a nice bit of a reconstruction at this site and the japanese love their reconstructions the japanese like showing you what they've been doing and what they've been up to and what they're um, they, they're really proud of their archaeology and, and telling us about their archaeology. So if you're not all potteried out yet, we've, um, we're going to end, we're going to, we're going to sort of try and get the pottery bit done. So what we've got now is, is we've got pottery that has these diversified designs. And we've also got a lacquered pot. We look at the we look at the lacquer in a, in a short while as well. Uh, I've, I've I've got a little thing I'd like to show you on screen about lacquering, and you've got this pottery here that's being fired at a very very high temperature. This pottery um, is known as a reduced form of pottery, and that there is an oxidized form of pottery. A reduced form of pottery is like, is restricting the flow of oxygen into a kiln, and just just baking these pots. So this pottery might represent pottery that's been fired seven, eight hundred, nine hundred degrees C before it gets a bit um, hotter, it starts to melt. And if they're able to create these temperatures, they're really into a world that, that is very advanced. So their forms start to diversify while a common uh, decorative pattern spread um, across other parts of China. You've got incised, incised design, the cord, Designs are still on their pots. They're still using cord to decorate their pots, but this applique design actually on the lacquer pottery here, um, using a, a, an oak that actually um, eggs used a, a poisonous um, amber-like resin. And this is what they're using actually for their lacquer. And at this stage, we've got huge mounds being constructed and, and stone circles and so on. So, so we're very much into this late sort of Yamon period. And they've got very large sites occurring. So if you want to 
have an analogy with this. This is something like the great mound builders of Mississippi or something like that, but that's coming a bit later as well. Uh, and, 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 and you're looking at this and you're thinking, well, that chap there, he's obviously got a, a military um, Japanese uniform on. And this looks like the, these excavations could have actually been in the Second World War. And around these sort of indicating these sort of large types of sites that, they, that they're, they're seeing, you can only have the Japanese who say to a whole school party, right, we want to show the outline of a certain Yamon culture site. We need all the students from there to sort of hold hands and sort of indicate where the site is. And then finally, this last stage of pottery, some of these types of pots look very similar. That, that could be nicely at home uh, on a late Iron Age Roman site. Um, and this sort of, this, this, all these look sort of very Romanish looking. And this goes all the way up to about 2,300 years ago. Elaborately decorated um, pottery uh, made in the northern um, Tohoku region and southern um, Hokkaido region of Japan. It shows quite a contrast to the austere decorative pottery made elsewhere, but there are lots of, lots of advanced forms of pottery. They really love their pottery at this stage. And so what, what we've basically done in the pottery, the incipient pottery, the initial pottery, uh, the early uh, Yamon pottery as well. So we've done all these charts as well. And remember, by the time we get to the final Yamon pottery and lots of the advanced pottery that we've actually seen, um, you're going to use these naturally to store rice and, and, and actually you, you, your ingredients, your ability to cook and your lifestyle and your balanced diet is, is very advanced at this stage. So what I'd like to do next is I'd like to quickly... Um, quickly mention about this sort of uh, late period where this sort of final Yamon period where you've got these rather intriguing sites and those people that you've just seen um, were in the field showing the outlines of the site so very very interesting area uh, and this itself is um, indicated an individual site a, a stone circle site associated with this final Yamon period and what we do have is halves around the outside, middens, uh, pit structures, housing, and all the rest of it, associated with these, with these late sites, very interesting, strange dynamic things going on. And what I'd like to do now is, is actually introduce the next area of this seminar. So hunting. Bows, arrows, and stone spears were used for hunting. And lots of their designs didn't change for thousands of years. And there's another point to be actually be made there. And I really wish I had a drink, so we're gonna have to take a, a break in a moment. We um, we look at this and I say that you know the the the, the types of arrowheads that they're using remain very similar throughout throughout the Yamon period. There are changes and advances and stuff. But because they work, the design doesn't change. But what they're bringing on is actually bone hooks and sort of bone holes. And, and well, you see all that with our culture as well. Um, now, if they had come to uh, bronze and iron and copper sooner and all the rest of it, the, um, they would have still kept used these um, chert, flint, um, obsidian arrowheads. And the point I'm trying to make is when you go to a lecture about British prehistory, they always say, right, on the 15th of October at 12.15 um, in the year 2,100 years BC, suddenly they had bronze and they stopped using flint. That's nonsense. Because we've got flint arrowheads seem to be used um, in an archaeological context into the Roman period. So arrowheads are still being used in the Roman period in Britain. And they're probably still being used much later as well. So these things, um, it, it's, it's, it's an assemblage, a seriated assemblage of culture, cultural artifacts that continue to be used, less and less flint being used um, as different tools develop, but they're still being used throughout the Amon period. 
And it's the same when we look at um, the British prehistoric period as well. So bows and arrows were used to safely capture game from a distance. Fishing gears such as hooks and harpoons were also developed to catch fish and shellfish. In addition, dogs were kept and plants were cultivated. In the Amon period, people obtained food mainly through hunting, gathering and fishing because it worked. If you're able to build a great house, um, live in a semi sedentary life and you don't re need to extensively go into agriculture, hunting can be something that you can do for a very long time over many thousands of years. Stone arrowheads, there, our lithics, and more advanced forms of lithics as well. Look at these. Uh, stone spears, stone, arrow, stone arrowheads, different forms, different design for the Yaman culture. It's going to be probably very difficult to date, date some of this from one Yaman period to the next because they're the same types of designs actually being found. And you might actually use something like this um, you might have a, a leather gauntlet and you, and you might actually toss something over. This could work that way or it could be, all of these could be mounted in a, in, uh, hafted in a shaft or something like that. So all these designs throughout the Yaman culture. And we'll, what we'll do, we'll have a bit of a break uh, now. So what you've got, um, these people have got access um, to all the animals that they hunt. Obviously we've mentioned that the animals, um, the, the animals uh, they hunted included deer, boar, and hare, uh, which were captured uh, using their hunting weapons or may have been captured in pits. So all of this, all these are excess products, um, other than the uh, chert and the, the obsidian that they're using for hunting, these could actually be made into very useful um, weapons of hunting. Uh, for example, you could break off, you, you could, um, one, one of those times, one of those times from a deer uh, could have little notches put into it, and that could be actually used um, on the end of a harpoon. Uh, you could think that you could um, use uh, lots of these, you could actually carve some of these bones and actually make um, fishing hooks and needles and so on and so on. So nothing was ever, ever really wasted. So everything uh, in this, this context would have actually had some use. So what we're going to do now is after the break, we're going to be looking at the, the, the different types of nuts and things that they gathered. And we've got nice, they, they, the Japanese love their horse chestnuts. And we'll look at how all those were processed um, in a short while. So what I would like to do now, it's now 11.40. And if we can stop the share. And I tell you what, I should be a bit more careful with myself because I think I've burnt myself out now. So um, so let's, um, let's just ask if there's any questions. Let's start off with you, Goff. Anything you'd like to say? No? Nope. Uh, are there any existing sort of stone circles or hinges or equivalents of still there in Japan? Uh, the ones that they've excavated, yeah, they, these these are very different stone circles. These these are more arrangements of low lying walls that create stone circles that, than the typical. There, there's one image that, that I showed earlier on. I said this is this is a lot later where there was some stone in the middle, but you had all these little stones around the outside. So yes. not like our stone circles. But a few years ago, I, I was doing a little bit of research into this. You do actually have stone circles, very similar to our stone circles, very near Japan in Hong Kong, for example. Um, so mm. stone circles do exist in lots of other regions of the planet. Mm. Um, Yamas, anything you'd like to say, darling? Who? No. I have muted him. To me? Oh yeah, I've got one thing to say. And the early pots that were pointy at the base, they would have fallen over. So the later yeah. pots with flat bases stood up. But no. maybe the pointy ones we used to cook in. Uh, but the, the point, the point hang them over a fire. above a fire. And obviously, obviously, whatever ingredients are at the bottom are going to heat up quick. Um, and there's, there's obviously, there's advantages to having pointy vessels. 
Uh, and yeah, you are right. They would fall <laughs> over. But obviously, if you're suspending them from a fire, um, there are other ways of storing. You might actually store them in, uh, store them in straw. But there are advantages having pointed bottoms. Pointed bottom vessels are stronger. If you ever had those little um, cod shaped bottles with a little um, uh, little marble in them, mm -hmm. I used to try and break the bloody things. Yeah. Yeah, did. yeah, yeah. Like ginger beer bottles. Yeah, exactly. The, the uh, milk bottles, the average milk <laughs> bottle, all you need to do is tap one of them and it smashes and goes everywhere. <laughs> pointed bottom. In a pointy bottle. Yeah. So, so Jamie Bates. Cool. It in the ground as well. Uh, who's first? And they're being stored in the ground as well. Easier to store in the ground. And and obviously, if you've got a tapered bottom, they're easier to take. Yeah, well, I suppose, yes. The and they have to take a little hole. Also, keep it yeah. also keep yes. it short, it? If it's in the ground, it's keeping it out of the sun and things. Yeah, exactly. 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 Um, so Is what a hole in do? your table? Oh, they're holding. Oh, shut up. Get away from this. Right. Right, I'm going to mute a few of you because I get a bit of crackle. Uh, we'll come back to Karen and Kathy in a minute. Jane, anything quickly? No. Interesting, though. Yeah, very interesting. No questions. Uh, Chrissy, babes? No, not at the moment. Thanks, Carl. Uh, Chrissy, Chrissy's been to Japan uh, to a bordello, and she doesn't want to tell anyone about that. <laughs> Talking about bordellos, how's your bordello, Pam? Anything? I love the pottery and I'm looking forward to the lacquering bit. Can you uh, just a bit more on it, please? Yeah, I've got, I've got a little bit more on that one. I, I've deliberately yeah. thought people are going to be interested in that one. The lacquering. I've got um, a go pottery on. friend on Facebook who's in Japan, but I can't think of his name at the moment. And I've got another one in South Korea, Sung Ho Lee. He does a lot of teaching. He's just been doing some lacquering with his wood ash. Me, me, me and Keith know Sung Ho Lee quite a bit. We've we've met him. Uh, <laughs> oh, you have <laughs> yes. I, I did have Japanese neighbours for a while. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I used to watch neighbours. I still do. Right, Ellen, talking about neighbours. Ellen, what is it like today in um, Estradoin? Are you having a nice day? She's not I was talking. Earlier about that um, round-shaped vessel with four spouts. It might have been if four people were sitting around and you could just tilt it to tilt any liquid out or something. Or, or one of those bloody puzzle jugs from the UNE. Thousands of years later, there was the Japanese tea ceremony and that. But um, I did wonder at the time whether it was for tilting and pouring. And there could be there could be lots of reasons. There could be lots of the four wave pottery. That's what they call them. Um, Andrea, before we go on to what Kathy's got to say. No? no, I've got no more to say. Um, and uh, I should have said at the beginning, menace. So, um, but be before and also um, before I say Emma Sugodo Quarado, which means break now. Um, Karen and um, Kathy after N H E Nisa U U and go after five go. Right. I only want to comment that in those photos of the um, excavations, the majority of the archaeologists have seemed to be dressed head to toe in white, which I would have thought was quite impractical. Uh, well, they, they are Japanese, and I'll just leave them there. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps they're like forensic suits, you know? Yeah. They don't yeah. uh, no, contaminate they had on the... like, It was like a proper suit. They, they didn't look like overalls. No, they, they did. It's, it's the Japanese. I, I, I can remember that my, my friend um, Yoshi Oida, when he used to come on the excavations, all, all the uh, female volunteers hated him because um, he used to he used to get them to. Well, one one day he, he he got all these girls to to carry this um, this really heavy generator that we had on site. And he, and he was just going like this. He was ordering them about with him, with his helmet on. I'm boss. It was really funny. Um, but the Japanese are a bit like that. I, I, they are really nice, but um, they, they don't know when they're upsetting you. Um, and, and Kathy doesn't know when she's upsetting me either. Kathy, anything you'd like to say now quickly? Well, just applique. Right. Well, I'm actually, Not applique. I, I'm actually going to go. I wondered now. what it was. <laughs> Yes, I, 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 I gotta be honest with you. My head shamed with embarrassment. I, I'm actually, <laughs> I'm actually gonna have a break now. I will speak to you after a knob. 
Okay. Domo okay. arigato. Coffee. coffee. <laughs> uh, I thought Chris didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I didn't yeah, understand what it was, Kat. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was some new technique I hadn't heard of. <laughs> and I'm going to have to... Actually, I'll just have water, thanks. So we'll have a... Too much coffee. Is... I do love my coffee. I think what I'm trying to, to achieve today is to look through over 10,000 years worth of history and by doing that it's just to give a bit of an overview i was given a book on the yaman culture about um, nearly two decades ago i was given it as a review book for archaeology world report and i thought it was absolutely fascinating because the japanese were excavating these sites and then they were reconstructing them and 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 other than that i knew very little about the Yamon culture, but it's very useful that we go through this nice little chronology as we're doing today. So the first image that we have in front of us um, shows you um, un shows you excavated artifacts, unearthed chestnuts, walnuts, and seeds of cultivated plants. So obviously the cultivated plants are over there on the left. I do believe that the uh, walnuts are there on the right, and then we've got the chestnuts. And this is archaeologically excavated evidence, so we know what they're eating, we know what they're boiling, we know what they're, they're digesting. And in my description, mountain vegetables and nuts such as chestnuts, walnuts and Japanese horse chestnuts uh, were an important source of food for people at the time. And obviously um, pine nuts as well and all, the, all that sort of available bounty that's out there. But the hunter-gatherer leading a sedentary life, actually a set life, but not fully into agriculture, is able to sustain um, an economy, um, but not have to go to the extreme of um, agriculture that we've gone into i.e. cutting down all the trees and are just planting and planting and planting. They're using their natural larder and understanding their natural larder. The chestnuts do, um, uh, do have a bit of say, taste, but when the bitter taste is removed, um, when they've been soaked and processed and, and so on, they can easily be eaten. They are also suitable to be stored and preserved. Uh, Japanese horse chestnuts um, should be soaked in water to remove the bitter taste and the remains of watering places for it have been found. So in other words, uh, they, they've got um, areas where they, they've been soaked in water. You, you've got the process, you understand what's going on. This is what they're eating. It is thought that they also ate mushrooms. And this is a strange one. I, I'm just trying to get this in my little bunts here. We've got evidence that they ate potatoes. Now, I'm just trying to work that one out, to be honest with you. Um, and yeah, yeah, exactly. I heard that there. And other root crops. Hard nuts uh, were used after being crushed and milled with stone pestles, grinding stones, and stone plates have been found, which we're going to actually look at now. So we're going to look at more of these unearthed uh, chestnuts as well. All archaeological evidence. So... The archaeological evidence doesn't lie. The chestnuts, there they are. And, um, and it's, it's in the detail, actually, rather than trying to put the detail onto it. What I mean by that is that we, we find so little evidence in our period that we're talking about here with the Yaman that we've got to guess. We've got to really guess what they're eating and... Um, and all we've got is containers that we might actually find some lipid residue or something in them. And, and that's all we've got. But the, the, the evidence that we see, and this isn't a pun, is very bountiful. Their larder is very bountiful in archaeology. It's that they've got many more jigsaw pieces to their puzzle within the Yamon culture than we could ever dream of. But we do find intriguing sites like Scarabray 5,000 years ago, 
and then must farm 3,000 years ago that, that, we, that we seem to catch up a little bit more. But the overview is with lots of these Yamon salt sites is that they're very bountiful in evidence all through the periods. And um, I, I, again, I, I, I thought this, this intriguing thing about that they come up with the early, middle and late, and then they added the final, and then they added the initial and the incipient. I absolutely love that. It's almost as if the Chinese thought, right, a Japanese, they thought, right, there's a lot more to this Yamon culture, so we'll stretch it this way a bit more or that way. But lots of, the, lots of these, lots of this evidence that you can see in front of us, and, and this, this is the point I've already made. The point I've made is that you get, you get some stone pestles, you get grinding stones and stone plates as you've got in front of you. All of these things that we see in our Stone Age, and we see them in our Bronze Age, and we see them in our Iron Age. Again, with our periods, with the Yamon periods, if these things work, you don't need to change the design. They might look simple, they might look basic, they might look like things that have been used 10,000 years ago, but they're okay for the purpose and they do the job. One of the, one of the other areas, uh, one of the other areas, we, we're, we're looking at a period where you've got layers and layers of this evidence and it's not less interpretation, it's actually management of the archaeological resource that the archaeologists had excavated in the first place. Now, I know, I know some of us are, are going to be really linked to this image, but I'd like to just uh, make sure that I can get on to my other stuff here. So fishing. So obviously, this previous image that we're looking at comes into fishing, a shell midden. And we get these shell middens um, in the Yamon period, and they love their fish. They love their they, they love their uh, their mollusks as well. In addition to gathering shellfish at, at the sea and the river, people caught fish by well by manoeuvring their dugout canoes skillfully. Now we've got evidence of their dugout canoes, and you're thinking actually dugout canoes. This is really basic technology. We we see dugout canoes here from a very early age they've got dugout canoes they really really work why why change something that's not broken and this 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 image in front of us shows lots of the fishing paraphernalia some of this would be very familiar to the fishing stock that i'm sure goff has got somewhere hidden in his attic now what we do find is that they've, they've got fish hooks why is that why is that important the fish hook is a revolution and I can remember when we did the when we did the lecture on the Greenland Vikings, and I remember I remember the the conversation along the lines that the Inuits had really advanced harpoons and the fish hook, but the Greenland Vikings didn't actually take on this technology, leading to partially the demise of the Greenland um, civilization associated with the Vikings, and this. This kit, this tool kit for fishing is there from a very early, early age. The fish hook and the harpoon, we, we see that in our culture, but, with the, but the fish hook is that innovation. So being able to fish on the line, and I'm sure Goff would appreciate that. Sorry to pick on Goff, but he's, he's, he's within that fishing realm. So being able to fish on the, on the line is very important because you can get multiple fish without without having to use nets and, and um, without the danger of, of, of net fishing uh, and so on. So and net fishing can be very um, time consuming. Um, fish hook, fish, um, fishing off the line isn't as time consuming as it, as it sounds. I went, I went fishing uh, with a chap on, on the coast and I remember that um, in about a two hour sitting, um, he, he had a catch of over 120 mackerel, really nice, sizable mackerel caught on the hook. Now, if you're thinking of that, would he be able to, um, in the, those two hours, catch as many fish on the net? Would he need a boat and all the rest of it? So the hook is, is an innovation. It, it's, it's a revolution. And also <coughs> able to think about um, fishing off the line and actually to have weights as well. So those are the weights at the bottom. So we have um, stone... Um, fishing weights as well. Anyone that's been sinkers, um, also sinkers for nets. That's another thing. So we, we, we do know that they're, they're net fishing as well. 
as well as uh, fishing off a line. And the Yaman people had thorough knowledge about the sea uh, from the area close to the shore, to the straits, as well as river fishing as well. And this is rather interesting. And, and I, I'm gonna, just gonna chuck something in the mix. Maybe we have this technology, lots of this paraphernalia of technology, but our landscape is being absorbed by the sea much quicker. Um, when we talk about the likes of Doggerland, so we're talking, if we want to go back to, let's look at this, um, let's look at the 11 to 7,000 years ago, the, this initial Yamon period, then we've got the our inundation, our Doggerland being lost, whilst they're building their settlements and, and so on and, and what have you, and and but their landscapes are not being flooded and inundated as quickly as ours are in regard to Doggerland. So maybe lots of this technology could have been lost and there could be lots more evidence out there that we haven't found. But for Japan, which is the subject of this, we've, we've truly got the toolkit that the Japanese would have used throughout the Yamon culture to actually be a very independent, a very powerful, um, self-sufficient uh, world. And we got the evidence of the harpoons and, and the hooks. We've got the evidence of the fish that they're eating. So the, the, the fish diet is quite wide as well. And, and when you've got a wide fish diet, you've obviously got an understanding of fish as well. Not just about the landward side with mushrooms and things that could be poisonous. And if you treat them the right way, you can eat them and so on. And you, you get the same with uh, fishing as well. Some fish can be uh, quite dangerous to eat. The puffer fish, for example, if you, can, you can eat that as long as you um, prepare it in the right way. Um, these people were very much um, in, in control of their diet and it was a very balanced diet. And you can actually see that within their civilization. And, I, and the question is about warfare. Is there any evidence for warfare? The answer is not really because this Yamon culture lasted a long time. There may have been sort of um, invasions from other people and so on, but this is quite a stable world. And being stable, being able to change your civilization, being able to communicate and all the rest of it is a sign um, that warfare is, is absent more than current or present, extant. Now, I like... I like this, this image because this says a lot to what I've already said. Now, what we do find is different Yamon levels of, of society indicated with this reconstruction. So you've got some, very, very, you've got some of the earlier periods of the Yamon culture on the right hand side with those, with those, um, um, those souterrane um, stroke, first floor, maybe loft buildings over on the right there. But these are those typical classical buildings in the more classical later and final Yamon period, 3,000, 4,000 years ago. These ones that you actually get, um, uh, you almost as if you've got a subterranean um, level. If we zoom in on this a little bit more, we've got, we've got a bit of a subterranean level. And then you've got sort of this, this undercroft. And then you've got a first floor. And then you've got um, you've got a second floor and maybe a loft as well. Story buildings, story buildings. Now we're not getting story buildings like this until the advent of the Broch that we did last night in the lecture. And we're coming there, we're bringing them in about 500, 300 years BC. So we're getting these story buildings. The story building is 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 another innovation um, levels, impression. Um, some of these buildings were the tallest buildings that these people would have ever seen, um, several meters in height, a number of meters in height. And the ability to have everything, you could keep the animals underneath, you could keep some supplies underneath. If it's stormy, if the landscape gets flooded, you're several meters off the ground. That, that building there uh, is about four or five meters off the ground. So you need to have a really good old flooding for your house to be taken away. And these are massively thick timbers. And the other point to be made as well, a really a classic important point with getting really large post holes in the ground that, I, that we've seen in these later Yamon periods tells us that there's lots of trees still around. They're not raping their landscape as we constantly rape and destroy our landscape even today. 
I'm very much somebody who actually hates the idea of the um, HS2, and we're still ripping out that, that our trees. We're, with the Japanese, they, they, they've got the habit throughout their culture, throughout their civilization, throughout their world, to be able to live alongside the natural environment. And you can see why that is. That's, that's way in their Yamon culture. That's way in their consciousness. And it's that sense of respect. It's not all about agriculture in, in this period of the Yamon. It's more about being connected to the landscape. And this is what happens. Civilization, culture that lasts a very, very long time. We can learn from these people, but we don't because they're Japanese, they're Eastern. And what can they tell us? Well, they can give us decent cars. They can give us technology. So the Japanese are giving us a lot, except not the way to be able to treat our environment. So, so obviously this, this nomadic sedentary life, they're still sort of hunter gathering at long periods in time as their sites develop throughout this whole period. We look at um, villages, dwellings, um, roads, rivers, traffic, <coughs> um, all the way across this extensive landscape, these hub villages where you, you get um, you get smaller, you, you get these hub villages and you get smaller and smaller villages and everything's in, in um, everything changes and they need to do this and all these different things happen. Um, so, and I think, uh, you know, you typically see these, see these films about Japan and you see these weird, these weird tower type structures towering up um, and you think, what the hell are these? Well, these types of structures on the left whatever they're for, ceremonial, ritual, um, meeting places um, to show out over the landscape and so on. And these people were obviously not scared of anybody because you wouldn't, sh you wouldn't say, hey, look, I'm over here, mate. I don't want you to kill me, but I'm over here. So it, it's, and, and what you don't actually see great defenses around these sites either. The defense itself is the building. Um, and that sense of communication and intercourse with 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 the landscape. So we, as we get later and later, we start to talk about large buildings um, with thick pillars, as you can see, mounds used as ritual spaces, particularly 3,000, 3,500 years ago. Stone circles, as we've mentioned, we had a little bit of discussion about that, um, slightly different from our stone circle sites. And we'll see what one of the stone circle sites looks like, should we, Keith? Go ahead. Bingo. That is a stone circle. Mm. You can see the difference. Um, now, if if I was to do, you know, we're on, a, on a Wednesday evening, we do comparisons of archaeological sites across Britain. So if I said, right, let's, let's compare stone circle sites with Japan, you'd think there's nothing like a stone circle, but that's a stone circle to somebody in Japan. So, so it's a ritual space. And, and that sense of ritualistic space is very important. Uh, the, the sense of an enclosed area, um, stone circle sites, you could see as a ritualistic space, a ditch around the outside, a wall around the outside, no stones in the middle, um, wood pillars, and, and these types of sites everywhere across the world. Uh, the, the, the outline of the space, whether there's a way in or there's not, is actually, um, is actually the, the space. So say, for example, um, I, I work from home now and I've got a little um, I've got a little office area in, in the big back living room. And my 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 uh, stepchildren don't come into this this area. Michelle doesn't come here to tidy up either. This is my space, but there's nothing stopping them coming in. So the sense of ritual is everything to everyone. And there's loads of different ways of interpreting as, again, what is a stone circle? This is a stone circle. And, and obviously the, the very, the, these are different structures from the ones we've already seen. Um, and, and I like this, this mysticism about Japan. I, I, there, there, was, um, there was a program that me and Michelle watched religiously at the beginning of the year, it was at James May in it. And he was looking at Japan. And, uh, and you look at this and you think that they, they, they're very different the Japanese. But then again, we can learn so much from them. So what we're one thing, one thing that with every culture is you've got life, living, trade, 
pottery, um, food, um, religion, and death, the afterlife, graves of the Yamon people. Uh, Yamon people were buried in pit graves. Some were buried um, in pits, others. Graves of adults arranged in rows, different ways of being buried. Now the word buried, a buried inhumation. Um, and as as and what they had landscapes which were all together. You you had the living, the ancestors, um, and your loved ones buried all in the same landscape, which is very different when you compare this with the British landscape. Typical British archaeologists would say um, Wiltshire burial ceremonial landscape, um, and people lived over at Durrington Walls. And you could say there were places that you didn't go to, like the Great Woods. Well, it's almost as if that's very different in Japan. Uh, there are examples, there are also examples of graves that were built on block in the village center during the late Yamon period. Now that, that's interesting because we see something similar when we look at the medieval village. Forget the blooming Roman city, and they always buried outside, then things change. But when, when we think about the medieval village in, in <coughs> Europe, for example, you'd have the village church, and then the village graveyard would be in the middle of the village, and you'd have the houses around the outside, usually. Or you might have a village green, and then suddenly you've got a plague, and everybody's buried in the village green. Well, the Yamon did this the other way around. They, they, they had their loved ones with them in the middle. Houses were around, around the outside. Aunt Fanny's buried over there rather than 12 miles away. Uh, so this is, this is what we see with the, with the Yamon world. It is very much, um, some of it is very much medieval in thinking. And graves that were independently set up away from residential areas um, in the final Yamon period. So you've got a complete change there. There's different ways that these people do things. There's nothing set. And this is a grave of a late uh, Yamon individual uh, with lots of bits of bone and um, animal bones and lots of other uh, pottery and lots of other things in there. However, this is rather interesting and I can't get my mind around this one. You don't see this. You actually see this in sort of Incan society. That is a pot within a pot and there's a, bit, uh, there's a child inside that. Um, they, 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 their dead children were buried in pottery. End of. A very different. And, and I, I just thought this was really strange that you've got, you've got two pots here. And, um, and I, I just, I'm just trying to, I, I, I maybe should have done more reading about this, but I'm thinking, well, was the pot constructed around the child? It surely must have been because I think it'd be very difficult to get a child in a pot like this. So that, that's probably what I'm thinking. Don't know any more than that, so we'll just move, move away from that. You can't have all the answers when you're doing a thing like this. And I, I, just, I just sort of, initially when I planned this, this seminar, I wanted to put this at the break time so you could actually have a look at this, but it's not worked out that way. And it, it's, and, and in my notes, as we go on, in my notes, it sort of says that you get um, you get waves of people going to Japan. The DNA says that you've got the initial waves of Yamon people in Japan, and then you've got sometime around 2,000 years ago, you get another wave of people going over to Japan, um, and it mixes the DNA, and you start to think, well, what's going on? What about Homo erectus and so on and so on? I don't like doing the DNA stuff because it, we don't really know enough. Um, you know, the, there are, you know, the million, you know, the, the millions of sort of um, little indicators in, in your DNA strand, and we don't really know it all yet. And we're still trying to learn that. But if you, if you want to dig this one up on the internet, or, or you want me to send this to you afterwards, I'll, I'll be, I, I don't mind. It's fine. So a little thing that we that we that I'd like to do now, I know um, that the lack of stuff is coming up, so we'll do that. So I'm very wary of time. So people are people are skillful, skillfully, we, we mentioned that they skillfully made these very small um, uh, dug out canoes. Um, pe people skillfully 
handle dugout canoes to achieve exchanges of trade with other peoples over long distances and transported jade, uh, asphalt and obsidian. Um, and obviously pottery and lots of other things to Japan and, and moving back and forth. Many clay figures used for ritual and accessories were also made. This indicates that they had a rich spiritualistic world. Well, no, it doesn't. It didn't indicate that they had a great trading world. Well, obviously spiritual comes into that. Um, I've always thought when archaeologists don't have answers for things, we always use the, spirit, the word spiritual or ritual. Now, um, Keith, um, this, is, this is approximately a foot and a half in length. What could this be? Mm. And it's made of, made of whale bone. Uh, a woman's corset. Nope. One more guess. Your whale. Is it a weapon? Yes. A boomerang. No, it's a weapon. A boomerang. Give, give that man, give that man a card. It's a weapon. This is actually a whale bone sword. It's a whale bone sword. So, um, um, so you, you can just see that that's where it's going to be mounted. Um, and this, this is the. It, it would have been sheathed as well. And this is actually. A whale bone sword. Amazing enough, you, you only get it in Japan. Obviously ceremonial, because I can't imagine somebody fighting with two whale bone swords, but he's right, give that man a card. So these are actually, um, these are bracelets made of white lined bittersweet. Now I had somebody look at what bittersweet was, and um, we did actually work what this was, but that's your homework for next week. This is bracelets of, made of white lined bittersweet. This is what these are, bracelets. That's your homework for next week. I know Kathy's going to jump in and she's like, I know the answer to this one. Now these here, um, as I mentioned earlier on, these are your um, obsidian, um, your lithic um, arrowheads um, and your spearheads. So these designs are used throughout uh, the Amon period. They're, they're designs that work very similar to the stuff that we've already seen, the chert and the flint and so on. So these are obsidian. Obsidian is volcanic glass and um, obsidian glass usually stays sharp. Don't do something that I've seen somebody do, take an obs ob obsidian object and go like this and oh my god I just slipped my hand open. They, these remain sharp. They are, they are basically glass at the end of the day, vulcan vulcanized glass. Um, and I'm going to show you something else really weird, right? Here we go. Let's chuck it in there. They had tablets. These are footprint tablets. Um, now, I don't think these were worn around the neck, but they, they were tablets with footprints on them um, with little impressions on them as well. Impressions of feet. Now, I, I, these, these are children's feet, but they're not exactly the types of things you'd wear around your neck. They're quite big. And if we some some of these are over a foot in length, so they're, they're quite big. And look at that as well, an ornamental comb made of deer horn. Now I think somebody somebody made the mis I, I think I'm not sure when this was. Somebody said, Oh, that looked very Viking. And I said, No, it's it's definitely a Yamon a ornamental comb. And um, this, this dates back, I think this dates back about seven or 8,000 years ago. So look how refined that is. You, you yeah. would find this on a medieval site um, 800 years ago. This is thousands of years old. Great, love it. So they were really, interest, they were really interested in their, um, in, in their portrayals and, and requiring these, these wonderful items. Now we've mentioned rituals and rites. Um, we get lots of very strange clay figures like this. Now look at that. Um, some, this, this is in a museum and what they've done, all the bits of figures they haven't put together. You've got these little heads and faces of, of, of these clay figures. Many remains of religious and ritualistic items um, whose purpose has not been identified have been found. Now we find this in lots of cultures. Uh, Kathy and I, when we've been to Orkney in, in Scarabray, they've got these round balls, spherical balls, which have been yeah. carved, and you don't know what they're used for. And in lots of cultures, we've got these things, and you start to think, well, maybe they just did them because they did them to confuse future archaeologists. Um, so shapes of people, animals, and sword-like stones. So you, 
it, it sort of comes into telling us a little bit more about how they may have looked or what how they perceive themselves looked as what they were actually used for we don't know they were religious obviously um, these are thought to have been used in rites for fertility and safety at hunting memorial services for ancestors and prestigious goods or they they um if we move on a little bit further they look like the types of things and and this this is i, I don't know they, they, these people actually had children they did actually have children. And you're thinking, well, did children actually, you know, work in the fields all the time? Did, did they actually, were they actually children? Did they actually play like children? I tell you what, fox clubs uh, play out, you know, and then uh, bear cubs play, you know, why can't human beings play? And then you look at this other thing and you start to think, well, um, don't these look the type, like the types of things that you'd give children to play with? So they're not ritualistic at all. You know, it, it, it's almost that thing as if, if in in societies in the past, we're, we're always like that. We're also in one channel. We're, we're in one direction. I think the word is anal. We're, we're going in one direction. And then when you actually look out and you start to think, well, they did have children and maybe these were objects for children to play with. These, these ain't big, vast things. These are the types of things which would have which would have fitted in children's hands. Little, little um Little, um, little earthenware mushrooms, for example, um, an earthenware doll, uh, and and um, I think um, did we say that that was um, uh, yes, a, a pottery sword. Well, sh you know, I, I'm thinking children. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I definitely am. Is 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 that what coming into your mind? And then there are these objects that actually answers. Um, we we we've only got. We've only got um, a little bit to go then after this, but lacquerware and wood pro products. Now, I, I look at this and I think if anyone gave me this, I would immediately think this is actually Incan. It's got it's got that sort of Incan design to it. It's mm, got that yeah. shape. It looks very Incan, but it's not. Um, lacquering, which had been established around the early Yamon period. So go to, to the early Yamon period. Let's talk about 7,000 to 5,000 years ago. Lacquerin um, is an integral technique that shows the advanced skills of the Yomon people at the time. So this is lacquering, um, this is lacquering on pottery, um, colored pottery, lacquered colored pottery. And it is typically red and I'll tell you why it's, it's red in a short while. I've got a little passage I wanna read out, which is here. So move on a minute. Um, so lots of the bowls and lots of the bowls are actually formed from chestnut tea, uh, trees, and it's describing that the, the, the chestnut tree is indispensable for the life of the Yamon people. Not only good for building um, uh, the chestnuts themselves, an important source of food, and you know bowls, and then these could be lacquered. So the posts used for building containers, tools, sticks for digging and fuel. So the chestnut tree was very important. Also, chestnut trees were very important for bowls that could then be lacquered. And if, as we do the description in a moment, uh, we've got some more of the red lacquered pottery. And again, I'm looking at this and squinting my eyes and getting in there and thinking, bloody hell, that looks Incan. So particularly the one at the bottom there, that really looks Incan, but the, the types of and it really looks at, and this this is actually being produced 7,000 years ago. Amazing, well before the Incan or the Mayan civilization, well before anything in the West, and this is so early. And I, and I, and I see there was some notes telling me somewhere that, that Japan has the first for lots of things. Not just the lacquerware, they, they've got the fir first for, you know, um, story buildings um they got the first for pottery and so on and so on so this is why we had to do all this so so back to the, sometimes wikipedia is useful and i thought right where can i get a nice concise thing on lacquer in and i thought bingo wikipedia so it has been confirmed that the that the lacquer tree existed in japan from 12,600 years ago the lacquer tree interesting this was confirmed by radiocarbon dating the lacquer tree found at um, a shell mound at uh, Torahama and is the oldest lacquer tree in the world found as of 2011. Now, the lacquer tree. 
Um, and it goes on, it goes on to talk about the poison oak sap. So uh, the lacquer was used in Japan as early as 9,000 years ago during the Yamon period. So that's actually earlier. That's in the, that takes us into the initial period, actually. Evidence for the earliest lacquerware was discovered at the um, Hakenoshima um, excavation site in Kokiado. Um, um, I think that's the North Island. Um, you've got the South Island, North Island, Japan, probably the other way around. These objects were discovered in a grave in, in a pit grave dating from um, the first half of the initial Yamon period. That takes us takes us about ten thousand years ago, actually. It says nine thousand there. Lacquer and technology may have been invented by the Yamon. Well, give it to them for God's sake. I can't see any other lacquer in anywhere. They learned to refine poison oak sap. So this is what's given the color and this is the, the, the sap itself, the amber that they're using to coat. The process taking several months to build up the layers. Iron oxide, again, to give it color. Cinnabar, cinnabar uh, mercury sulfide were used for producing the red lacquer as well uh, as, as, the, as the pigment that's, that's being seen in the oak sap is all put together to give that sort of red lustre lacquer, lustre lacquer, yes. Um, lacquer was used both on pottery and on different types of wooden items. In some cases, burial clothes for the dead were also lacquered. So lacquer is being used for lots of things, including forcing goth to yawn. Many lacquered objects um, have turned up during the early Amon period. So that's into what we're talking about. This is when it's big. Um, 7,000 years ago. And um, so this, this tells us that lacquering was a massive part of Yamon culture. Experts are divided on whether um, Yamon lacquer was derived from Chinese techniques or invented independently. Um, so, oh God, let's not give it to the Chinese. So let's look at this as being, let's look at ja uh, Japanese um, lacquering, Yamon technology, developed independently in Japan rather than being introduced from China as once believed. So two different ways. Let's give it to uh, the Japanese. Don't know the evidence in China. This looks absolutely brilliant. So uh, moving on to my next image. So obviously looking, looking more about the lacquer in here. So not far away now. Um, I've got some couple more images. Let's go on to them. Here we go. Now, this is where it gets a bit confusing. So physical characteristics of the Yamon people. Now, I, 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 I thought about this, but I thought I'd chuck it in there. Now, a typical Yoyoi face. Now, the Yoyoi culture is the culture that comes after Yamon. Precisely 300 years BC. Um, I won't do the usual thing on the 14th of October at 5.15, but suddenly somewhere along the line, the, the, the Japanese have basically said, bang, Yamon culture, Yoyoi culture. Um, and you're thinking, I, 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 I'm struggling with that. You've got this, the Yamon lasting for a long time. Maybe their facial characteristics develop, um, developed anyway um, into um, the characteristics on the right. And it, it's a bit like... It's a bit like this thing that I absolutely hate. When anyone mentions the Celts, I get really upset because I get upset because it's nonsense. Because um, it's almost as if saying the Celts came over from Europe, killed everybody and suddenly were the Celts. Nothing like that has ever happened. Nothing like that happens in history. E even, even with the diaspora of the Second World War, when we've got the, the wiping out of gypsies, um, Slavs, um, Jehovah's Witnesses and Jews in Europe. We still got all those races in Europe, and then that was ethnic cleansing. So um, it's very difficult to do that. So I'm just thinking, well, Yoyoi was probably a development from the Yamon people. But read what my notes tell me. Um, the average height of a Yamon person, and I've done this, was um, 60, 62 inches. So just over five foot. Um, and then the average height of the Yamon woman was 58 inches, um, around um, five foot in height. So these were quite short people. It is thought that they had they were quite muscular, though. 
and had fairly sculptured faces like the ones on the left. Like I can't, I'm struggling with it, but you can probably see this in their bone, bone structure. And this will be very interesting for our wonderful Ellen. Teeth with cavities have been found. It is thought that Yamon people ate much starchy food. A great number of whipworm parasite eggs have been unearthed. And this finding indicates that Yamon people must have suffered a abominable, abominable pain. Can't get it out. Deformed ankle joints have also been found on the skeletal remains of the Yamon, suggesting that they probably often sat down on their heels or squatted. But to be honest with you, I, I thought Japanese and Chinese people do that even to today. So what the, the last real thing is that we've got this little chart. And I'd just like to make two little statements at the end here, and that, that'll call it a day, day, day nicely. Yamon culture and world history. Worldly wise, two, two sections. Since the earliest known pottery, which exemplifies the beginning of the Yamon period, has been unearthed, uh, it is now thought that the earliest pottery was created um, here in Japan. The earliest pottery that we find on the planet is in Japan over 10,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago. It's there, it's there. Rice cultivation um, began in China and somehow it got over to Japan, um, but it probably, it probably didn't develop, develop properly until much, much later. But um, five, 6,000 years ago, we, we, we're getting um, rice in Japan. And what, what, we've, what we've probably got is we've got millet as well, and we've got coarse cereals um, shortly being introduced into Japan. And what we also see as well is that this culture, if we want, if we want to put this up against, so, so by, by the uh, early Amon period, you've got, um, you've got roads, uh, you've got buildings, you've got their tools, uh, you've got the settlement in diet, You've got pottery and trade and so on and so on. Uh, this, this in the, if you want to look at the middle Yamon period, 5,000 years ago, this is, this is coming into the period of the height of um, the pyramids. Um, 4,600 years ago, the, great, the three great pyramids at Giza are being constructed, which is, in, in, which is coming into the height of the, um, the Yamon period. And then we get the Mesopotamian civilizations. So that puts on a contemporary basis. What's going on in Britain? Scarabray, we're still scrabbling in dirt and we're building Stonehenge. And then finally, Yamon culture, Yamon culture to the Japanese. The Yamon culture to the Japanese is, is massively important in, their, in who they are. We don't talk about us feeling that we're Iron Age people or us feeling that we're Bronze Age people and so on. So the Mon Yamon culture continued for a very long period. And it wasn't a stagnant period. It wasn't an immature society. It was a society that developed. It was a society that made the Japanese who they are today. It was a mature society with superior technology for a very, very long period of time. Pottery, the lack of work, all those types of things, understanding the, land understanding the landscape, understanding the, the, the ecology like the Native Americans did in the north of, of America, like the Aboriginals have done, is, I believe, a mark of civilization. We are not civilized in the West because we, we don't really understand the damage that we're doing to the environment. So these people are far cultured than we could ever be at this present moment in time. And this is thousands of years ago. If we don't talk about religion and so on, we can put those spiritual elements within their life, their understanding, as we see with the Native Americans in, in North America and the dream space with the Aboriginals. Um, it can be said to have reached the ultimate development of hunting and gathering culture um, without the need to <coughs> destroy the landscape with, with plowing and so on. So they're able to have that, that intercourse with the world. Since Yamon uh, people are the direct ancestors of contemporary Japanese people, it's no exaggeration to say that contemporary life is an extension of the Yamon culture as it is today. Vis-a-vis, -vis, that is a really nice end to um, what we've done today in the seminar. And I'd like to mention quickly before we have questions, keep them brief um, because I've got to be well finished before one. And 
Next week, we're going to be the, doing the temple buildings of Malta. So anything you need to say now, keep it to um, one question and um, let's, I know that's going to be difficult for Ellen and Pam, but we're just going to give it a go because I know Goff needs to go to the dentist. So, um, right, Goff, anything you'd like to say quickly? No, no, very interesting. Not very often you go to the Far East. Uh, so it was great. Thank you. I really enjoyed that because I, I've learned, it's good when you're doing a lecture like this and you're learning as well. Keith? No, same as Goth, really. Very interesting going to that part of the world. And uh, maybe you do something on China soon as well. That'd be interesting. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm thinking that I, I, it's in there, but there's so much I want to do. J uh, Jane? Yeah, no questions. I was just thinking what a shame it was that Dennis wasn't with us to tell us a bit more about it. And yes. in, a way, in a way for the whole lecture, I, I, uh, and, and when I did this on Tuesday, I was thinking of Dennis and, um, and I'm sure Dennis would have actually loved this. So um, yes, definitely. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Dennis, always. Jim. Um, the subterranean part of the building, did it show any evidence of drainage? Methods no, of drainage? no, oh. no. They filled with water, they filled with water. Um, but then this is what I thought. So I'm, I'm going to pass on that one, but they're not, when you see the images, they're, they're built up levels. So um, maybe there's a reason for that. Um, and the, the post would have been fired to keep them waterproof. Anyway, yeah, good point. Ellen, chop, chop. Uh, no, the same as Jim about the posts and keeping up off for water. Keep, keeping up with appearances, I think. Um, what about you, Chrissy, babes? Just an observation, really. Um, if uh, Japan was the same as it is now, only 20% of the land is available for agriculture, and most people live around the coast. So the fact that they had to be hunter-gatherers for such a long time meant that they had perhaps leisure time, unlike someone who's farming, to go yeah. out and develop their crafts and things. Yeah, I, 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 all of that, exactly, all of what you just said, I, I'd agree, and and um, and I think, I, I think there's so much we can learn from these people, and I, hopefully we've learned some some of that today. So, uh, Andrea, thank you for that. And anything, Andrea? Yeah, the Hokkaido is in the, in the north and very cold. Is, are, are all these in the north? Is there anything in the south? No, right. Good. Or was point. it just as cold then? Because it's freezing in that part. Uh, good point. Obviously. Obviously, um, climate and temperature and everything is, is very different back then. So we, so all of it, all of it's in the Northern Island, all, all of it's on the north tip of the Southern Island as well. So that's what's going on. You can interpret what you like there, but that's going to have an, that's going to have an impact on their civilization as well. Very much so. So Pam. Very interesting. It is, it's good. I, one. I've got nothing to add now. Okay, um, th thank you. Thanks. Okay. okay, thanks, Pam. And uh, Karen and Kathy. Uh, no questions for me. That was yeah. very interesting. Yeah, it was. Mm. Oh, well, that's good then. That's that's brilliant. So we know what we're doing next week. Anyone wants to join us on Saturday evening? Great. I'll see all of you on tonight as well. Those that do my Thursday evening. If there's no other questions, I've really enjoyed this. I know you've enjoyed it. Jim, Jim, yeah. spit it out quickly. This one, it was a quick one about the the uh, walk that we were going to do, the history walk you can do in Cal, in, um, Bridge End. Is we're, that on online? We're, we're, we're going to be thinking about streaming that, yes. I okay. will I will let you know, but it, the, the date might slightly change. So okay. Okay. If there's, I, I will let you know, Jim. If there's thank nothing you. else anyone wants to say, thank you for that. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to go sayonara, sayonara, Goff, Keith, sayonara. Andrea. Sayonara. Karen and the mask woman, Karen. <laughs> Take care, guys. Bye. Yes, bye. bye. Keep, well. Right, bye. Keep well. I will. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.